Making life worth living and retirement worth having is about the people in our lives. It's about what we do. It's about how we say it. It's about how we feel. It's about how we look. It's about how we practically do just about everything in life. The problem is that when we're interacting with other beings, with other people, we have to know where our boundaries begin and where their boundaries end and vice versa, where their boundaries begin and our boundaries end. You see, practically, we have people who think they have the lawful right to ruin a life. Now let's think that through. We have people who want to do all sorts of things to their personhood, to their paperwork, and to their property. These people own their personhood, paperwork, and property. Yet there are other people in the land who think they have the lawful right in their version of a god nation state, if you will, to remove that person's right to their personhood, paperwork, and property. Am I making sense? Some of you are not sure why I'm talking all the time about rights. You see, in the international world, there are human rights. And human rights allow us the dignities of our land to not only have a clean water source, but also a flowing toilet and literally protections that allow us the right to choose our physicians, to handle our version of God, and to assemble with whomever we so choose without being mobbed or militarized to the point that we have no ability to move freely in our nation. Those are the main principles of the 28 or 29 tenets of the International Declaration of Human Rights, which our country helped to lead with Eleanor Roosevelt and her leading man president husband at the helm. Now, there was 400 some countries involved in putting that little document together. Some of the leading minds of government and politics handling that issue. In America, we have federal laws, and federal laws give us the United States Constitution, which none of us really learned enough about in high school. We all had to take U.S. Constitution history class, but it was too late, I think, in our educational processes. We really need to start utilizing those ideas in kindergarten, and I'm serious about this. We must teach children where their rights begin and other rights end. And it probably sounds a little odd to say it that way, but that's the absolute truth. When we share toys, that's a sharing of rights. When we move food across the table and say, here, let's trade this, that's a sharing of rights. When we do little deals like this, we are teaching children about human rights. The right to choose, the right to accept, the right to deny, the right to decline, the right to protect one's rights, and the right to protect one's body from things we're allergic to. My loving father could do a lot of things for me in life. He could teach me to build with wood. We built an entertainment center one time to fit all my stuff perfectly. It wasn't beautiful, but I love that we did it together. My mother could teach me sewing and to possibly do things with music, but in truth, she couldn't teach me things about photography or technology or other aspects of life. Now, why am I sharing that part of the story? Because my father could never remember that I'm aller highly allergic to a particular food. My mother, on the other hand, could sometimes remember at this point in life. My sister definitely remembers that I'm allergic to it. Other people want to tout that we should eat that particular food and we should love that particular food and I know precisely how much of that particular food I can have before I have a physical problem. That is what someone does who manages their allergies. If it was a severe allergy, then I'd have a highly severe severe reaction, but maybe I have. Maybe my allergy has changed to have that severe reaction. I don't know. But the problem is that if I choose to eat that food, that's my choice. If I choose to eat it because it helps to practically move a few things along, then I might do that. But in life, we have TMI, of course, to share with people and giggle about. But at the same time, we have lawful rights to protect our bodies from the vile acts of other people trying to harm us, trying to maim us, trying to destroy our right to privacy of our body parts. Now, I shouldn't have to be any more explicit than that in an audio cast, that in truth, there is propriety in this world. The people who want to go to nude beaches can go over to California or Hawaii and get on those places and expose it all. But in our normal society, we don't walk into rooms, we don't act in ways inappropriate in terms of whipping things out or dropping drawers or showing people literally our bodies. Now, there are people who literally don their entire body with tattoos and they are allowed to do so without one mental health check, without one physical ailment condition, and they don't get condemned. Uh, carded or 
improperly imposed upon when they make that $100, $200, $300, $1,000 purchase. Now, in my mind, I think that's a hell of an investment to put in a paint on your body, but hey, that's their lawful right to choose to do so. But when we're talking about other aspects of plastic surgery in terms of reductions, enlargements, and other types of modifications to allow ourselves to feel whole and beautiful and healthy, is there some sort of check we should have to go through? Not necessarily. But in some cases, the physicians require it, which is somewhat illegal, immoral, and illicit. And why is it illegal, immoral, and illicit? It's because a person owns their body. They also own the responsibility of what they will feel like after it's done. We have seen many botched plastic surgeries in our life. We also know of the horrible condition of one incredibly famous singer whose surgeon screwed up the surgery to the point that it cost her some of her singing voice. So we know that physicians are malicious and also have malpractice when they fail a person with their hands and their skill sets. Sometimes they do it intentionally or they're paid to do it intentionally, which is maleficent. It's also ill-willed and ill-natured and illegal, but they won't admit their sins. They will have to admit their sins before the Lord. But in other cases, people have the right to modify themselves. I often talk about the situation that is sort of interesting and intriguing in a way to me, that there's a woman who has millions of dollars, a wealthy, wealthy person, who has been transforming her face, her body, to look more like a feline. I don't know what the attraction is to her in doing this, but no one seems to question that sanity because she's a millionaire and can do whatever the hell she wants with her own money. When a person is in poverty, that is not always the case. We can say no to certain things, but people in positions of power will literally try to put upon us things we don't want, don't need, don't feel, and don't care for because all they have to do is employ a physician a psychiatrist, a counselor, a therapist, or someone in a field of intellectual study who will literally make a choice to put indications on a person that are not necessarily truthful. They can render their opinion, but that does not make it lawful in the house of the Lord. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, there's plenty of religions out there that do not honor the medical community. They feel that religion and medicine do not mix. They also feel that physicians utilize their religious backgrounds, their feelings on conditions and issues to intentionally interfere with people's lawful right to protect their bodies. There are plenty of Catholic physicians who refuse to provide anyone any type of contraceptives to protect people from unwanted pregnancies. They think the rhythm method is supposed to work for people even in today's age. And maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. But I'm talking about something realistic here. When we're talking about the physical addressing of issues in a person's physical body or cellular health, it is completely, totally, and utterly up to that person individually to decide who their physician is going to be, what they're going to allow that physician to see, what they're going to allow that physician to do, and frankly, whether or not they're going to even allow that physician to be participating in their legal development of medical records on their life. And if someone does not agree with the physician's opinion, it is our natural, lawful right under the law to get second and third opinions. Everyone knows this. Even when we're doing something with regard to an automobile or anything else, we are allowed to get a few other opinions before we make a purchasing decision. The challenge in our world today is that physicians seem to get a pass on being required to tell us how much their services are going to be costing us. They seem to be the only industry and profession that is allowed to charge people bills without the person ever knowing how much it's going to be in advance of that decision to decide to hire them for services. Now, does this seem fair and reasonable to the world? I don't really think so. I think it's a lie that organizations tell. At the same time, we have physicians who will require someone to wait four and five months just to get in to see them for supposed specialty, only to discover once they're there that they were lied to by the administrative staff about their personal abilities, about their seasoned experience, and about their actual understanding of a particular issue that puts a person's medical files at great jeopardy and risk with their stupid little opinion that is based on absolutely no physical practice, no physician's practice, no experience with those type of situations, patients, or illnesses, or 
if we don't call them illnesses, issues. And frankly, that is a problem. We have many people in Indiana who do that, and I've experienced it to the point that one particular situation with the loss of a physician who sadly died of an aneurysm, we hope that it was a natural cause of death and not some nurse who just thought she'd take him out in some way, like a woman I think might have done something like that. But in truth, we have to be real, that people do pass away, so we have to find new physicians. And when we have the right to go and look for a new physician is we interview them. There's some good companies in IU that allow you to actually have a little interview with the physician. So I literally did that. I spent an hour talking to a physician on his dime and mine to find out whether or not he would help me with a particular condition that I needed some regular maintenance with. He agreed totally. And as a result, I provided all my medical records to be put into a file which I thought would be just protected in his office. Turns out that was not the case. It turned out it became a system-wide file, which pisses me off to no end because I don't want to have all my records out in the public forum or any person I might run into can access. At the same little time, I don't like the fact that people have illegally hacked my medical files and interfered with my lawful right to have the right physicians in my life. Now, I evaluated a physician with a group that came into town and just launched and started and found him completely wanting. Not only did he not have any background experience with my particular issue, that he also had absolutely no understanding of the history of the issue either. He couldn't cite one iota of the original standards of care that went along with this condition. And not only that, his version of bedside manner was so patronizing and pathetic that I was insulted. I was humiliated and I decided to leave that particular individual immediately. I was not going to play in their little playground of jumping through their hoops after I had lived with this condition for more than 20 years of my life. And they thought they were going to put me back at ground zero in something that I've been managing my entire adulthood. Now, when I share that part of the story, how does it make you feel? Hopefully, it makes you look at your own life. It makes you look at your own physicians. It makes you look at your own rights with regard to your health care. Who has the little right to know about what's going on with you on the cellular level, on an intimate level, on a personal level. And what pisses me off about physicians today is that they literally will ask you the name of all your brothers and sisters, which isn't their right to know. They will ask you the name of your lover, which is also not their right to know. They'll ask you whether or not you're having sex, which isn't their right to know. And I'd like to know why. Why do they literally think they have the right to ask us who we're intimate with? We don't ask them that question. If we turn it around on them, they say, I'm sorry, that's not your business. Then why is it his? Why is it hers? Why is it a physician's right to put that in a medical file that any nurse, any administrator, any person who writes up our receipt for the bill we have no idea how much it's going to cost gets access to. And that's literally my furiousness with the medical situation we're in now. That most physicians are learning that insurance companies are literally destroying their rights to not only get paid well, but also literally making it so difficult just to give out care because every company is getting an association with different pharmacies. And if you're a person like me who's very sensitive to different types of things in his cells, I don't want some physician to think he's got the little right to tell me what I can and can't put in my body after I've been managing my health all by my lonesome with the help of certain physicians for 20 plus years and he might just be a new person in my life. He is not someone I know, like, and trust. He is not someone I would ever give my life to and I'm not giving my life over to any physician to make a decision about my life. At the same time, I am absolutely infuriated with certain situations in Indiana where judges who have absolutely no medical degree whatsoever and highly religious biases are interfering with the lawful rights of human beings in our land. And that's something we should be outraged with. Now, when I talk like this, what does it make you feel? Yes, I'm a journalist. Yes, I'm a reporter. Yes, I'm telling life story. And yes, I'm literally saying, look at your own life. Whose rights in your life are being taken from you? Do you still have the rights in your own life, or do you just think you have rights in your own life? Do you have protected medical records, or can any person in any position of authority related to a government agency go in and get a copy of who the hell you're sleeping with? That's why I'm upset about these physicians' questions, because we have HIPAA laws that protect us only in the medical community. It says that they cannot talk about us, but it does not prevent them from giving your information out to a person in authority who might take that information and manipulate it or harm you with it or harass the persons you love with it. And that's something we have to be concerned with. 
the thin blue line has to get outside of their comfort zone sometimes in dealing with different type of people but you either protect everyone or you only protect a few people which is it in this land i cannot say now when i talk like this i am somewhat a politician i'm definitely a reporter i've been forced back into journalism by the life threats that i've been given in my situation and frankly i get tired of the game my life is not a game for some physician, some therapist, some officer of the law, some judge to play with. And what that creates in people when they, we get harmed, harassed, destroyed, literally taken away from in our life is a rage. A rage that is powerful. A rage that says, I'm going to make sure that in your next political campaign, you lose completely. Now, what does that mean? It means we get involved with our communities. It means we get involved with politics. It means we take more consideration when we go to vote in the polls. And it means we get tired of these politicians who lie to us through the entire process of their campaign and then flip-flop all over the place based on who pays them the most once they get into office. We see that all the time with our president, sadly. And I really like the fact that he made such a marketing play long ago with his on-air apprentice to put himself in the face of millions of Americans. By doing it like he did, everybody became to know his name outside of the books that he's written, outside of the real estate deals we hear about every once in a while. He basically marketed himself right into the president's position, and he did a brilliant planning job to do it. That was a true genius long ago. I pretty much could see that. I could predict it. And when it came to pass, I was like, no kidding. The American public, public loves television. They love American Idol. They love all these type of shows that take the average Joe and puts them in position of power and success. But we don't really hear about those folks much other than a few times on the radio. But are these people really living on millions? Maybe they are. Or maybe they made just enough in order to have a retirement worth living later in life. It's hard to say. Maybe they go on tour. Maybe they have a great following. Maybe they sell lots of records. I don't know. We have one-hit wonders, and then we have people like Aerosmith and others that have been around for generations and years, and we just love them because of who they are as individuals, as people. They get to travel the globe. They get to be anywhere and everywhere as artisans and whatnot. But what about everyday regular people? Now, when I talk like this, I have to look at how much time is I talking. Sure, sometimes. But I have to practically say to you, where are your rights? Who is protecting your rights are the American citizens who are in the military and in the police force. But if those people have religious stint, are they really protecting everyone's rights or just some people's rights? You see, religion is something that we're supposed to have freedom of according to the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. There are certain religions that I don't agree with at all. The snake charmers can go back to the back hills as far as I'm concerned, and I think they're foolish to play with the Lord's uh, animals in this way. It is foolishness, and I guarantee it is not something that the Lord is pleased with. I pretty much have a guaranteed quote on that one. But I don't have to produce anything other than my opinion and what I hear in that regard. There are other people who literally think that donning a turban and keeping their hair from being seen or covering women's faces is appropriate. I cannot say that the Lord is pleased with that sort of mentality because it dishonors what he has created in the beauty of people's eyes and nose and mouth and ability to speak freely in this land. Now, that is an opinion. It's rendered by a man who is sort of in line with what he's supposed to be doing in life now. But I'm also a person who has lost a lot. I have lost a lot from the people who take away rights. I have now had so many people monkey around in my legal records and documentation that I am utterly furious. And openly, if it was happening to you, I guarantee you would be just as furious as me. Now, how do I move you to care? How do I help you to see it? How do I get you to acknowledge that it only takes one person to rebuke a pastor for that pastor to go off on someone and create a retaliation mobbing force that destroys a human life. I'm pretty much sure that that's what's happened to me. I rebuked a pastor for his arrogance on stage and how his little way of handling things on a regular basis for God help me three years of listening to this man's sermons to try and figure out why my friend was so messed over in the mind and arrogance and everything else was literally because it was coming from his pulpit. There was no conversation about the love of God. There was nothing other than he was wonderful and everybody in his congregation was not worthy of the Lord. And I just got tired of it.
I definitely rebuked him, and I'll rebuke any man for that thing. Rebuke is a form, literally, in the Bible. It literally says that when something is off-putting, when the Lord is not in something, that we have the right, the honor, and the privilege when we're moved to do so, to rebuke someone. But we rebuke them in a private way. We send them a letter. We talk to them privately. We give them a note. It doesn't matter. We make a phone call. But when a man decides he's going to poison people by getting them to literally mob a person to death and interfere with their lawful rights to live freely in the land of America where we are home of the free, land of the brave, love of mom, most of us, apple pie, and other things, we have to really get who we are today. What is America today? It is not a melting pot anymore. It's more a smorgasbord where we get to pick and choose what we like for our life. But when someone takes away our rights to pick and choose, when someone forces us to be in front of physicians that we would never in a million years choose because they come from infidel countries, we have to literally be able to say no to those people. I've now been put in front of several people I would have never chosen for my life to be seen by them, and I find it offensive. Do I have a retaliation factor in my mind? Very possibly. Do I care about their life? Not at all. Why? Because they put my life into a joke category. Now, when I talk like this, what does it say? It says, I'm talking about real politics, the real aspects of being American, that freedom is only ours if people allow us to be free. Now, who gives us the right to be allowed to be free? Well, our Constitution does, which is what I started with this, and practically the people around us do to a point. But there are societies that do bully a person to death. Bullying is a major problem in Japanese countries, not only amongst youngsters, but also amongst older people. They use a form of submission to control people based on hierarchy, based on age demographic, based on positions and powers, and it is somewhat suffocating for people. There's also some wonderful aspects of it because everybody knows their place and everybody knows how far they can go in life. America allows someone to become a one-hit wonder and make millions and go on to a great retirement. That is one of the beauties of our land, that everyone has the opportunity to live free, high, and mighty if they can make it happen. But in life, we have to learn how to love on people. We have to learn how to show regard for people's rights in this land. And when we have sisters, and when we have a mother, and when we have a pastor, and when we have other people, officers, who hang around us because they have illegally, immorally, and illicitly done something to our life, we have to wonder what sort of land we live in. Now, when I talk like this, I am definitely putting forward parts of my upcoming film, The Dragon Priest. And these parts are to let you know what's coming. What's coming is a major film. What's coming is a mega superstar leading the way as director. And what's totally going to come is that my mother is either going to be proud of her son or is going to be put under the bus for the lies she's told on my life to people she had no right to talk to. And openly, I can say that proudly in my soul, that my father loved me greatly. I can't say and profess the same for other people in my sibling set, but I don't care about their lives anymore is pretty true. When they betrayed me, that was it for me. And lawfully, there's a person that I want to talk to, but she's so immature or she's being so mind-controlled by her pastor that she is not allowed to do it. Or the technology tools between us are being monstrously misguided by those technology companies interfering with my lawful right to tell someone I love very much how much I love them. Now think about that. This is America. We should be able to tell people we love them. We should be able to talk in peaceful ways. We should be able to get around in ways that we need to. And we should be able to walk in the street without some monstrous Noblesville person thinking that it's odd that a man is walking with his travel bags in the street because we become so spoiled by having automobiles in our communities that we've failed to recognize that not everyone can drive, that not everyone has a license, that not everyone has car insurance, that not everyone literally has a car anymore because someone monstrously impounded it and made it so expensive to get out that they can't get their car back. And those are the monsters of our community who do that without the lawful right really to take over our property like that underneath the federal constitution and amendment four but these people don't really look at that 
They only think locally they can do whatever the hell they want to. They don't recognize they've just violated federal law and human rights law. Now, when I talk like this, how does it make you feel? I don't know. Are you smart enough, savvy enough to talk back? Maybe. Are you willing to participate in a conversation? Hopefully. But in life, politics is about three things. Personhood, paperwork, and property. And I have the lawful right underneath the U.S. Constitution as a reporter to render my opinion, to make observations of what I see. And here's what makes me hurl. Is that more people would rather snare at me for walking my work through the community than simply stop and say, hey, can I slow the traffic for you so you can get across the road more safely? When I was sitting in a Panera this morning having a lovely breakfast that I hadn't eaten there in a long time, I literally thought, what a wonderful thing, this table full of men having a fellowship group. I talked about it in one of my earlier podcasts today. But in truth, as I was beginning to leave, I had to physically move a table to get around this group that was taking up an entire part of a a restaurant. They didn't think about putting the tables together in a different way. They consumed an entire half, which meant a handful of tables couldn't be utilized at all by any other patrons. But you know what that man said? He literally made fun of me. That old man in his 60s or 70s thought, what is this guy moving in? And I thought, who the hell are you to talk about my life in that deranged, ill-mannered way? I just let it go because I know what men in that age group are like. If they are not in the house of the Lord, if they are not attending a church, if they are not participating in a godly Bible study, they are monsters in their mind about what they have the right to do. And they lived at a generation and a time and a station in life when people still had retirements available to them. They have the luxury of time management to have gotten where they are, to have the freedom to sit in a group of fellowship. But when they make fun of a total stranger, Without knowing their life at all, it is ill will. And that should be a shameful act in the United States of America. You have no right to know what's going on in a person's life if you don't take the time to listen. And you certainly don't have the right to promote any sort of illness towards someone else when you know nothing about their life. A 20-minute conversation, an hour conversation, gives you not enough information to render any opinion at all. Yet people are being paid to do so illegally, immorally, and illicitly in a lot of situations on people's lives. And I hope that the people listening will get the message that when you think you represent God in this world, you do not. And I promise you that God in heaven is powerful. He can fold your little body in half in seconds. He can save your life or he can let you go. But either way, when you monsterize someone, when you mob someone when you participate in the harassment and hazing of man's life and the destruction of a human being's opportunities that the Lord planned for them, you will receive a retaliation that you will never get out of in this world. Now, that is not a monstrous thing to say. It is the promise of the Lord. It is the promise in the Bible that says, do unto others as you had have do unto you. But practically, people don't think about that. The people who render decisions on other people's lives don't ever think about what will happen to them when they are put in a position to have an opinion rendered upon them. And that's the sadness in the land. That people have forgotten the rights of America. The U.S. Constitution was fought for and died for by many men over millenniums of our lifetime. From the earliest of settlers in the wild, wild west to the United States Air Force, Marines, and Military, Army, Coast Guards, etc. that protect our land and our seas from the infidels that would love to kill us all and take over our property. That is what we dishonor when we think we have the illegal right to mess around in someone's life, someone's property, and steal them blind. They have dishonored the Lord above all in everything. But most people don't care about God anymore, right? So when I'm talking like this, I'm talking like a real live person who has opinions, who has rendered observations from his experience of living life as a homeless person in a community where most people will just pass by. A few people will stop and have a conversation, but very rarely will someone actually sit down and create a relationship with someone that lasts, that says, I'm in this with you. I understand the pain you're going through, or I literally want to know how I can help you in a way that's honors your life, your soul, your spirit. And that's a sadness in this world. More people than not will pick up the phone, dial a police officer, or shit all over someone with some concept that they're going to control them, that they're going to go off and buy them a meal, or they're going to go off and buy them a hat. And who the hell gave them the right to make a decision about that for their life? 
it's only a way to make them feel better, not the person they're trying to supposedly look after feel better. Now, when I talk like this, how does it make people feel? I don't know. But I am producing every little bit of my life, every single minute of the day. And at some point, somewhere, some podcasting company is going to get that I have some interesting things to talk about. I have some interviews to definitely conduct with others. And at some point, someone will say, you know what? This little fella has worked his butt off to create a portfolio that has the right to get on the air in some way that makes him shine and other people shine as well. Now, this has been Blake Jensen of Blaze Communications, LLC, the author of Soul Keepers, The Soul Strings of Our Life, the author of the upcoming book, In God's Name, People Go, and the playwright of the upcoming film, The Dragon Priest, Light Provision. Thanks for listening.